morning. I'm so glad to see you. I just wanted to talk to you and say thank you so much for your flexibility this week for uh, Porch Drop Tuesday, which became Porch Drop Thursday because of the tropical rains of Cristobal. And uh, we uh, had a great day on Thursday and you really came out. A lot of community members came out and we were able to support Parkway Pantry very well. Um, this week, we're going back to supporting LifeWise. We had to get the Parkway Pantry in there for their 16th distribution, but for our Porch Drop Tuesday on June 16th, we are doing our Uncanny collection for LifeWise. So and, uh, by Uncanny, we mean cans of fruit, vegetables, and soup. And they didn't limit us on uh, vegetables. So if you want to bring corn and beans, yeah, I can. And, uh, but we need lots of stuff to support their, uh, their uh, food distribution every week, which is about $15,000 worth of food. So uh, we pr appreciate all that you can do. And um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, as you mostly know, Pastor Kurt is retiring. And though we are sad to see him go, we are gonna be able to celebrate, not in the way that we traditionally hoped, but in a wonderful way with joy, um, uh, for his drive-by parade on June 21st, so a week from today at 11 a.m. So we hope to see you there where we can stop and talk and give our love and respects for four years of wonderful ministry at Green Trails. All right, I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday and Sunday and until we can be together again, welcome to worship. Good morning, Green Trails. It's our joy to be here to worship with you wherever you are. And our team, we have a big team today, so we're kind of excited. Amy Olson on vocals, and Mary Heil on vocals, James Hasig on vocals, Sam Heil singing and playing uh, the synth, Bill Fenlon's playing guitar and, and singing, and Eric Muir, the one and only singing and playing drums. And I'm Jeffrey Heil, I'm the director of music. We're gonna start with a setting of Psalm 46 that we have spoken before in worship, but especially in this crazy time, it's the, it's the psalm that always reminds us of the sovereignty and the power of the love of our great God. So we're gonna start with Psalm 46. trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth. 
the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord, Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. If you could please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we are certainly living in a tumultuous time. We have so much that we're dealing with, Lord, that we're, we're overwhelmed with, with thoughts of illness, with thoughts of tragedy, of injustices, of upheaval, of just so many things, Lord. But we are thankful, Lord. We are so thankful that we have your guidance your peace, your love, your understanding. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help guide us as we seek to be the church outside of these walls, as we seek to make positive changes, Lord, in the, in the world you have, have left to us to take care of. 
But we know, Lord, you have not truly left us because you are there guiding us. We ask, Lord, not just for ourselves, but for, for hearts and minds around the world to open up to you, Lord. So often we become convinced that we know what is right. We tend to tune out things that, that try to guide us in a different direction, Lord, and, and we ask that you open our hearts and minds to the way you would have us go, not to trust in our own hearts and minds, but in the path you lead us on. For that is truly the way forward, Lord, to go by the path you have before us. We ask all of this, Lord, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Green Trails Church. I'm Rita Gatter, Connectional Ministries Director, and I am so excited to bring you our children's moment once again on this windy day. I have a few scenarios for you, and I want everyone to think about what is similar with all of them. I have an ice cube tray, and if I fill it up with water and I put it in the freezer, what happens to it? They become ice cubes, which that's so great to feel it in my hand on this hot day. My next scenario is if I have an egg, and if a mother lays on this egg and it hatches, it becomes a cute little ducky. And we all know this story. In nature, you have a caterpillar, and what does a caterpillar become? It becomes a butterfly. So if you think that all these things together say it's a change, a transformation, or different, then you're on the right track. Today, our scripture verse is about Saul. And Saul eventually did become Paul. And Saul was a man who was persecuting the early Christians and he was really mean to them and he was walking down this road and he was plotting ways that he could make these early Christians go to jail and while he was walking Jesus spoke to him and said Saul why are you persecuting me Saul was actually blind for three days but after that he was a changed man he went from becoming someone who wanted to hurt the early Christians to becoming a believer in Jesus. What an incredible story of how Jesus helps us understand and do change. So let's finish our children's moment here with a prayer, asking God to help us be like Paul. Dear God, we pray today for you to guide us to find ways to see how knowing Jesus changes the way we see everything. Let the story of how Paul became a believer provide us with stronger faith in you. In your name we pray, amen. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the land of Canaan. I am bound for Canaan's land to see. I am bound for the land of Canaan.
In the early 1970s, the boss, the great Bruce Springsteen, wrote a song whose title reminds me of the story of the Apostle Paul that we'll be studying this morning as part of our sermon series, Focus. Take a closer look. You may know the song, uh, Blinded by the Light, has some wacky lyrics. And it wasn't Bruce's version, but it was another group, Manford Mann, that had the hit with it, if you recall. That's Manford Mann that did Doo-Wah, Diddy, Diddy, Dum, Diddy, Do, and Quinn the Eskimo. So they are a group who knows their way around a wacky lyric. Now, I don't quite know what Bruce is saying in the story of Little Early Pearly or Go-Kart Mozart, but I do get the blinded by the light part. Light generally uh, makes things more clear, right? But sometimes it is so bright, it does the opposite. Yet the result of the experience of the light is that something larger and more important happens. As it is when we are blinded by the light, we are ultimately illuminated. There's a lot of theology in Bruce Springsteen's songs. He grew up a uh, devout Roman Catholic family in Freehold, New Jersey, the 1950s and 1960s. He lived within spitting distance of the, uh, the church and the parish school. Of course, biblical themes make their way into a lot of popular music and, and literature. From birth, we are ingrained and thus influenced with the rich images of faith of love and hate and sin and redemption and death and resurrection, of revival and rebirth. We are taught that no one ever is out of the reach of the love and grace of the Lord, no matter how far we may have wandered, and that is good news. We all possess the black heart of the sinner, but we have all been and can yet be washed with the blood of the Redeemer. No wonder we cling to these images. Therein lies the roots, the genesis, the dawning of this thing that we call hope. The greatest malady that can plague the human condition is not this evil virus that we face or the pandemic of racism that is presently demanding our focus. No, it's the loss of hope. And further, the greatest gift visited on the human heart is that no matter how far you wander from the things of God, the road home is always lit with the light of love. Hope. Sometime back, I preached on Stephen. He was the first martyr to the cause of Jesus Christ. His story is told in the sixth chapter of Acts. And at the tail end of the story, he is being stoned to death, and the text says and Saul approved of the killing. And you go, wait a minute, who, 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 wait, who's Saul? You know, the Bible does that sometimes. It just drops in a name, and all of a sudden you're going, wait, where, who? Anybody you know do that? You know, just starts talking to you about something or someone that you don't know, and they're, they're using their names, and yeah, we do, don't we? So it says, Saul approves. Well, look, we know that Stephen was executed for championing the cause of Jesus Christ. And the Jewish authorities didn't like the cause of Jesus Christ. Well, Saul is a good Old Testament name, so we figure, oh, well, I guess he must have been one of those guys. Well, in fact, he was on steroids. There was no one in those days that was more actively and savagely persecuting the followers of Jesus than this man named Saul. And then one day, all of that changes. Saul is blinded by the light. Let me share with you his story. It's from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. We begin with verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's the way of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. 
Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Then, in the ensuing material, Saul will have a most dramatic conversion. What is remarkable is that it took him from a persecutor of epic proportions to a hope dealer bent on spreading the gospel throughout the world. Though not one of the original 12 apostles, Saul ended up becoming the most prolific contributor to the New Testament, penning possibly 13 of the New Testament's 27 books. Of course, we know Saul better as Paul. You know, for me, the most persuasive evidence of the Christian faith is the profound change that unfolded in the lives of Jesus' closest followers. Saul, Paul, moved from a persecutor of Christians to one of the greatest believers that ever lived. And his story is one of the most compelling narratives in the Bible. I would argue that he is a figure second to none in the development of the Christian faith. Scholars and historians do not agree on everything that is attributed to Paul, and they differ on some of his theological views, but no one seriously doubts the impact that this one person had on the early church, and thus what shape the Jesus movement would take. Paul became a tireless preacher and teacher and evangelist and church planter. No one went farther to spread the gospel. No one worked harder. No one faced more resistance or exhibited more resilience than the Apostle Paul. So we, we laud his faithfulness and his energy and his passion and his tenacity, and we marvel at the thoughtful and often beautiful letters he wrote to his churches. But what does that mean to us today? 2020 in the world that we presently live in? Well, I would say, what does it mean to us in a word? Everything. Paul explored in his writings not only what you needed to know to be a person of faith, but what you needed to do, and moreover, how to do it. You know, sometimes we can think of faith as a set of laws or rules or codes, but Paul preached it and, and wrote about it as it was a collection of actions, a way of living that was a response to the sacrifice of Jesus and the grace of God. So let's fast forward. 2020, the age of COVID-19, the pandemic that stopped the world. And if that weren't enough, we have si simultaneously reached a tipping point, it would seem, in our long battle with the insidious evil of racism. And suddenly our minds and our streets are filled with uncertainty. And I'm here to tell you, Paul's words speak to us through the ages, down through the generations. Now, there are many thoughts out there today, many ideas and opinions and agendas that fill up the airwaves and the newspapers and the televisions and the social media. Some are worthwhile and some are not. But I believe the teachings of Paul to be great words of wisdom for our time. And while I truly believe that our words would be helpful to the larger world out there and their larger audience, I speak for and to the church. But I am absolutely certain that were we to really live out the true calling of the Christian as Paul saw it, we would definitely have a positive impact on the world as a whole. And that's our method as Methodists, isn't it? To transform the world by knowing Jesus and then making him known. Well, if it is, let's thank Paul, because it was Paul who originally conceived and propagated and broadcast that doctrine. We know that God of the Old Testament was consistently, constantly pressing God's people to be more fair and equitable 
in the treatment of all people. And we know the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth, and he ignited all of what God said with his sermons of good and right treatment of the least of these and the least and the last and the lost and the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the imprisoned. We know Jesus' heart for the sick and the infirmed, the, phenor- the, the foreigner, the minority, the oppressed in whatever form. And then the apostle Paul came along. And with God-inspired wisdom, he translated all of that into a distinct call to action. His awesome, creative, and brilliant metaphor was that we, the faithful, are the body of Christ. Not the bodies, but the body. The present physical whereabouts of the Christ is in the heavens with the Father. But we, the followers, are the body active on the earth. To expound on the metaphor of body, Paul writes this in his letter to the church at Corinth. He says, the body is a unit, that though it is composed of many parts, and all the, although the parts are many, they all form one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, and we were all given one spirit to drink. For the body does not consist of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the members of the body, every one of them according to his design. They were all one part. Or if they were, where would the body be? It is there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor can the head say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we consider less honorable, we treat with great honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with special modesty, whereas our presentable parts have no such need. That's Paul. But God has composed the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that they should be no division in the body, but that its members should have mutual concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We are the body, one body, each a part, dependent and interdependent, necessary to each other to function properly. In other words, on this earthly journey, says the word, To quote a phrase we hear a lot these days, we're in this together. We're in this together, like it or not. We are inexorably linked. If coronavirus has taught us anything, for good or ill, the engine can and will grind to a halt when the weakest and most vulnerable not by their doing, but by circumstance, suddenly require so much of our attention. And it's clear now that our inattention to these vital relationships and conditions has left us all vulnerable. The body has to attend to the body, all parts working as one for our general health and well-being. Our tendency is to separate and to segregate But that undermines this fundamental teaching. Now, while we think Paul's instruction is right for the world, there are competing narratives out there. There are other religions. There are other traditions. There are other voices. And they are all important. But here's what I would say to that. We don't need to worry about that. All we need to do is get our part right. We are a body with a charge One body, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. And when we act out otherwise, not only are we unfaithful and break the heart of God, we contaminate and poison our own bodies. 
We travel around deaf and dumb and blind, and the result is predictably chaotic. It is written, if one suffers, then all suffer. We are the body, and the work of the church is to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free and open the eyes of the blind and preach the good news to the poor. That is what the body of Christ has come in the world to do, to encourage and to strengthen and to help people, to deliver them from guilt and misery and sin and to set them free from the bondage of bad choices and bad luck and bad habits and then bless them with a gospel of grace. We are a body with a charge to stand in the gap, to speak up and speak out for those who cannot stand and whose voice is not heard to champion justice, equality, tolerance, and understanding. We are the body. Now, let's remember as Christians the statement that we are all in this together. It doesn't mean that we all can or will make an equal contribution to a positive conclusion. Together does not mean the same experience. For example, in the case of COVID-19, in many ways, the idea of social distancing is a privilege all lifestyles and living conditions do not permit it. Otherwise, it's easier for those with a savings account and health insurance and a relationship with a doctor to get care. And it's harder for those who are in life limbo, waiting to immigrate from a deadly regime, or maybe incarcerated, or in low-wage employment, or you are forced into a dangerous situation by the relentless and often heartless pressures of commerce. And of course, we have those among us who flaunt guidelines and ignore earnest warnings, but that doesn't change our job. To be in this together means we may well walk with the vulnerable, but also have to compensate for the selfish and the reckless. Now, while it fights the novel virus with no cure and no vaccine, our one body must pledge solidarity in the fight for human rights and social justice as well. Remember, we are neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. We are one body. We have commentators of all stripes out there asking, why has the murder of George Floyd hit such a raw nerve? Ah, nerve. The body. It is a body blow, and the body is sick and reacting. And for me, somehow, I see a connection from the COVID pandemic to our awakening to the pandemic of racism. COVID has aroused our empathy and humanity. It has broken open our hearts. It has slowed down the world and engendered introspection and reflection. It has required listening and trusting. It has demanded citizenship and cooperation and consideration for others. It has necessitated sober focus as we have been blinded by the harsh light of the grapes of wrath that we have sown. One body in this together. You know, I've spent a, a career studying the Bible. The Bible's a rich book. 66 books, in fact, written by dozens of different people over hundreds of years written from different points of view for different audiences at different times. But for me, it has this overarching theme that I keep coming back to, overarching theme that helps inform all of it. The Bible is a book about how God interacts with us, about how we interact with each other. And what we find is a deep and wide, diverse story. We tend to think, particularly today, of our own tribe and our own race and religion and denomination and tongue. But the truth is, from a distance, we must see that God's children are one body, a single tapestry of God's design, woven of many threads. Think of the American tapestry now with the fine yellow threads from the Far East and the strong black and brown fiber from Africa and South America and the sinewy white cord of the Europeans, and the hallowed red strand 
of the natives. That is the tapestry, the mosaic that the creative creator, the Father in heaven, sees. While we divide and divide and divide. We have woven a story of white against black and white against red and white against yellow and brown and other. And it's all a lie, a false fabrication made of whole cloth that bears the stain of thousands of years of useless, senseless bloodshed. People of faith, Christ followers, we have a role in the transformation of the world. Transform it into a better place, a place of justice and mercy and love and peace. And it requires of us something, sacrifice, humility, discipline, generosity, and grace. And by all means, it requires of us doing more than we have been doing. The good news is God is still God even as we have lost our way and we have veered off the course and we have rebelled, and worse yet, we have been indifferent to the work and the will of the Lord. We have done serious damage to the body, but it is not irreparable. Even as we see national polls that say 80% of the people in our country think that it is out of control, we believe in God in the heavens, a God who is in control waiting for us to unclench our one hand and link it to our brother or sister, our fellow traveler, and unclench our other hand and reach out for his in the heavens. And let me close with more profound words from the Apostle Paul. This he wrote to the Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord. Do not be anxious. Trust the Lord. Lift your prayers and petitions. I'm going to close this with prayer and then a song. Let us pray. My petition this day, Lord, is for a healing of your body, which is sick to the marrow. We revel in our worldly success and our financial achievement. We brag about the car in the driveway and the watch on our arm when our hearts and our minds are diseased. Heal us, we pray. We don't think we need a thing. We're self-sufficient. We're large and in charge. And the truth is we are selfish, ignorant infants, often our own worst enemy. Heal us. You made us in your image, and we have defiled and distorted it. But you say we're redeemable. I don't know how, or I don't even know why you do, but you do. And we need redemption and revival and renewal and restoration to be made whole and holy. Heal us. We know that our calling to heal the world is at best delayed if not denied. If your own body is too weak and too warped and too weary to comply, may we repent for when we have been resistant and reluctant and lazy and hard-hearted or too obsessed with our own comfort to understand that the house we are so proud of is on fire and the body that we spend so much time and money making beautiful is rotting from the core. Healer, we are focused on you. Blind us with your dazzling light of hope in this dark night of our souls. Amen. I believe that every heart is kind. Some are just a little under you. And hatred is a symptom of a time When someone must win and someone lose I just want to love you while I can All these other thoughts have me confused I don't even try to understand Maybe I'll get up Turn off the news Turn off the news and build a garden Just my neighborhood and me 
We might feel a little less hardened. We might feel a bit more free. Turn off the news and raise your kids. Give them something to believe in. Teach them how to be good people. Give them hope that they can see. Hope that they can see. Turn off the news and build a garden with me. Trust builds trust. Prejudice and bigotry's a bust. Trust builds trust. Don't you want to be happy? Well, dream is something we must always do, even when the end is not in sight. Fear is when we get scared of the dark, but faith is when we're not scared of the light. And justice is a cause that's never lost, even when a win is overdue. I could sit and contemplate the cost, or maybe I'll get up, turn off the news, turn off the news and build a garden, just my neighborhood and me. We might feel a bit less hardened. We might feel a bit more free. Turn off the news and raise your kids. Give them something to believe in. Teach them how to be good people. Give them hope that they can see. Hope that they can see. Turn off the news and build a garden with me. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, uh, let us be your gardeners, planting your gospel of love and life and good soil. Let us be the nurturers and the waterers. Let us bear good fruit that feeds and nourishes. Lord, may the gifts offered to the church this day spread like seeds in the wind, landing where they are most needed and flourish unimpeded. May they grow, multiply, mature, and glorify your holy name. Amen. And we have one more song to lift up. I know whom I have believed. Let's do it.
again, let me thank you for worshiping with us this morning, wherever you may be. The World Wide Web gives us a worldwide audience, and I know that we are being seen and heard as far as Florida because someone told us that recently. So, hello to the Sunshine State. And for now, may the sun shine on us all, and may our focus move from inward to outward until and until we are together again. May the eternal love of the Father, the amazing grace of the Son, and the intimate friendship of the Spirit be with you. Amen.